What's going on engineers? In this video, we're gonna be looking at the OAuth2 authorization framework and specifically why it exists and how it works. In the big picture, the whole purpose of OAuth2 is to allow you as a user of say website A to allow access to website B to access your data on website A. OAuth2 is often confused with something like a standard API key. And the reason this confusion is made is because they're almost used in the same way, but with one small distinction. If you're already a user of, say, website A, and you want to access your data programmatically, then it's common to use something like an API key. However, if another service wants to access your information, then that service would use OAuth2 to get your authorization to do so. From a user standpoint, implementation of OAuth2 can be seen on the Engineer Man Knowledge Center, for instance. In this case, as the operator of EMKC, I'm offering the ability for users to log in via Discord. So me as a user, I'm saying I would like to log in to EMKC via Discord, and I do so by clicking Login with Discord. One important thing about OAuth2 is the service that wants my information, in this case, Engineer Man Knowledge Center, must say up front exactly the scope of the data they'd like to request. And the user is following control. The user can see right here, this will allow Engineer Man Knowledge Center to access your username and avatar and access your email address. And a little bit later in the video, I'll show you exactly what I did to make it access that exact information. Once the user is satisfied, they can click Authorize, in which case they've told Engineer Man Knowledge Center that they are now authorized to request from Discord that information, name, username, and email address. We can see now that the login button has been replaced with my profile picture, which shows that I am now logged into the site. So now that you've seen at a high level how it works, let's look into the actual technical specifics of how it works. And I've actually written some code that does an OAuth2 flow, and we'll definitely look at that as well. For context, I'll be using Engineer Man Knowledge Center for all these examples. So in this chart, client is going to be EMKC, and then the resource owner, authorization server, and resource server are all going to be Discord. Keep in mind, the OAuth2 flow is usually between website A and website B. The only role the user plays is just to say, yes, that's okay, I authorize them to do that. The first step is the authorization request. This is when I actually click login and it sends me over to Discord. This authorization request code-wise is nothing more than just sending a user to a specially crafted URL. Besides the base URL, which is of course Discord's, it's gonna contain a couple other pieces of information that tell Discord what it should do. The client ID is supplied to tell Discord what application is actually trying to request the information. The redirect URI exists because once Discord is done doing the authorization, it needs to know where it should send the information back to. Response type is saying, I would like a code back. And then the scope is saying what actual data the service would like to access. So in this case, it's identify and email. Now there's no standard list of scopes. Any service that offers up OAuth2 protocol can specify what scopes they wanna offer and then what data is associated with those scopes. The second step is the user will either click authorize or they click cancel. If they click cancel, then a message will be sent back to that callback saying, hey, there's an error for whatever reason, either the user canceled or there's a problem with the server but if they grant it, then a code is sent back to that callback. So step two is gonna be redirecting the user back to this URL at the completion of either the authorization or if they cancel. The third step is going to be taking that authorization grant, which in this case is a code, and sending it to the authorization server. Keep in mind that the code that comes back from the grant is not enough to access the user data. The code is only good to trade up for an access token, which can then be used to access the user's data. The code will come back in the query string and then that can be used to make a call, a simple HTTP request to Discord's authorization server to get an access token. There's six pieces of information that gets sent over and three of them were in the original thing. We already sent the client ID, we sent the redirect URI, and we sent the scope already. The three new things is the actual code, the client secret, and the grant type. The code, of course, is the code. That's whatever came back from the authorization step. The client secret is going to be a secret string of characters that relates that client ID that's within the application. That way they know that you are authorized to actually make this access token request. And then the grant type is going to be the type of code you're providing. In this case, it's an authorization code. The fourth step here is the authorization server gives you an access token back, and there's no real reason why this wouldn't succeed unless the code is revoked or it's just old. The fifth step is to use our newly acquired access token and make authenticated API calls to a resource server. In this case, we're making a call to slash user slash me, and we're supplying the access token that we got from the previous step. Now keep in mind that Discord's going to check that access token to see what it's allowed to access. 
So if I try to use it to access data that the user did not authorize me to have, then Discord's going to reject that request. Furthermore, the access token is a temporary thing. It doesn't last forever. I can't use it a month from now. In the case of Discord, I think it's good for seven days, but it's configurable per service. Now, if your service for whatever reason requires prolonged access to user data, you will get back what's called a refresh token at the same time you get the access token. Refresh tokens typically never expire, but you are required to store it somewhere. That way you can use it and that will let you get a fresh access token. The reason access tokens have to expire and refresh tokens don't is because access tokens alone are enough to access user data. Refresh tokens aren't able to access user data directly, you would still need to pass your client ID your, and your client secret, which of course is secret. And so, you know, people wouldn't have your client secret and therefore couldn't exchange the refresh token for an access token, even if they had it. And then step six, of course, is the user data comes back to your service and you're able to do what you'd like with it. In the case of EMKC, it matches the Discord unique ID back with the unique Discord ID that's in EMKC and then logs that person in. There's tons of libraries out there in various languages that will do the OAuth 2 flow for you, but it's sort of pointless given that you can accomplish the entire thing in roughly 60 lines of code. And just a review of the steps again, the user will authorize access to their data, which in return you'll get a code. You can take that code and you can exchange it up for an access token. Then you can use that access token to make authenticated requests for the user's data. It really is that simple. And that's it for the video. You definitely want to get familiar with OAuth 2 because it is the standard way to authorize third-party services to access your data on another site. If you have any questions or comments about anything you saw in this video, please feel free to leave them below in the comments. Other than that, I hope to see you on the next video. Take care.